said good afternoon. It's already been a very long and busy day, a great day here at North Idaho College. I'm Laura Rumpler, the Chief Communications and Government Relations Officer here at, of course, NIC. And it's my absolute pleasure to be the moderator facilitator for this morning's forum. And with us, we have Dr. Samuel Todd Brand, and I will turn it over to him in just a few minutes if he wants to do any any brief welcoming remarks on his own to you, but I'm gonna tee up what the next 55 minutes or so will look like for this forum. We had the opportunity to have faculty, staff, and community members submit questions ahead of time for our candidates. All five of our candidates will be asked the same questions during these open forums. Um, Dr. Brand today will be asked a series of questions this morning. I have eight questions for him. And then this afternoon, one of my counterparts, um, one of our deans um, will be hosting the afternoon forum and then he will have the opportunity to answer another series of questions. It is great to see the mix of people we have here in person, as well as we have many people participating and listening in and observing on Zoom as well. So Dr. Brand, I'm going to give just a few little tee up comments about Dr. Brand and then we'll turn it over to him. Um, just so you know, his full bio, as well as the bio of all the other candidates is on the website. There is also a feedback form for anyone who has participated in this process to give feedback to our consultants at the Poly Group. That information goes directly to the Poly Group and they will consolidate all that feedback and information and then present it to our board of trustees. So if you wanna go onto our website, of course it's www.nic dot edu slash presidential search. So Dr. Brand comes to us after spending over two decades working in the field of higher education and originally from Mendenhall, Mississippi. Did I get that correct? Yeah. Okay, great. Dr. Brand has spent the past three years serving as the chief academic officer at Ashland Community and Technical College in Ashland, Kentucky, supervising all academic programs on the three campuses there. And in his spare time, he enjoys coaching youth basketball, powerlifting, acting, and reading. So Dr. Brand, I'm gonna hand over the microphone to you if you wanna say any introductory remarks and just turn it on. And then we'll jump into questions. Check, check, ah, oh, there we go. How's everybody doing? Oh boy. All right, so remember, I'm the first person here and I'm very nervous. So you have to do that again with some enthusiasm, and it's also, it is afternoon where I'm from. So we'll say it again. Good morning, everyone. Woo, thank you so much, thank you so much. The one thing that I would start out by saying is I am going to be uh, probably the candidate from the road less traveled, if you wanna look at it that way. I have a really weird background. I hope you can wrap your brain around. I will tell you right off the bat that I am passionate about three things in my life, three things besides my family, which I'm crazy about, but one is Broadway musicals. Ooh, that's weird. Two, the 221 full court press and basketball and three community colleges. And I can get all three of those in one place. So I, to say that I've led a full life and been blessed is an understatement. That is exactly where I'm coming to you from. As she said, I have spent the last three years in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. That has been an eye-opening experience. They are a totally different animal than Mississippi was as far as how the colleges were organized. The school that I came from in Mississippi was much like North Idaho College. The similarities are glaring and it is exactly what I'm looking for. Kentucky is a system of 16 individually accredited colleges, but that operate as a system. And when I say system, think of the Galactic Empire and Star Wars. All right, and so the chancellor of the system, we, we refer to her as Darth Vader, I'm just kidding. I do play the Imperial March at CAO meetings. It drives her crazy. She said, you've got to stop doing that brand. I said, well, it's too much fun not to. So Mississippi though is set up like, more like Idaho is. We've got 15 independent colleges and they are truly independent. They report to local boards of trustees, just like North Idaho does. They have residential halls and they have the arts and they have athletics and everything else that I'm looking for. So that's kind of where I come from. I do have a tendency to rattle on, so I'll stop now because I know our moderator wants to get to the well, first question. Fantastic, Dr. Brand. I will jump in with the first question. 
Why are you interested in moving to this region of North Idaho? And what is your understanding of the advantages and the challenges we have in this region? Well, I've answered partly that question in that I think it's time for me. Um, I'm looking forward to the next phase of my career. Um, I've wanted to be a college president for about 20 years now. I did decide to kind of take that slowly. I had some friends that came through graduate school with me and they really wanted to push, push, push to be a president. So they jumped around to different colleges. And if you look at my resume, I don't, I don't have, you know, five or six colleges that I've worked on and I don't have five or six different roles that I've served in. I stayed at one college at Meridian for 17 years. And the reason that I did that, and I, I use this as an example, and I always hate to use sports analogies because somebody might not be a fan, but I think about Chip Kelly, and he's been on my mind since I was thinking about how to address this group and kind of explain where, where I come from. And Chip Kelly, of course, just exploded onto the national scene at one point, coaching at Oregon and then coaching in the NFL. But what a lot of people don't know is before he was there, he spent about 15 years at small colleges nobody had ever heard of as an assistant coach. And what he was doing was he was honing his craft. And so that's what I tried to do at Meridian for 17 years. I got my doctorate and I thought about what do I want to do? I got the chance to become a division chair and I stayed a division chair for 13 years supervising the same group of faculty. So you can imagine how tired of me they got in those 13 years. But what I really tried to do was again, hone my craft so that when the opportunity came and I really got ready to step into the next, the next role, the next phase, I would be ready. And so when the opportunity came to move to Kentucky, it was twofold. One, it was a chance to be at a different level, chief academic officer. But then it was also a chance to see, I guess, for lack of a better word, how the other half lives as far as how the systems were set up. So I really wanted to see a different way of how community and technical colleges were viewed in this country and also see if I could move away from Mississippi. I wasn't sure that I could do it. I'd been there for over 40 years and had family there and all of my relatives were from there. So you talk about being entrenched. But we were able to make the move and I knew it was going to be difficult and we did it. So now it's looking to that next phase. And again, in looking at this region, it's very similar to what we have in Mississippi, believe it or not. I found a lot of similarities between the two institutions and the one that I was at in Meridian and the one here. There are also some similarities between ACTC, where I currently am in North Idaho. But I really think that this college is more like Meridian. So I'll draw a lot on those experiences as I talk to you today. I think economically we have the same challenges across the United States. I think those are ubiquitous for people that are in community college administration. When I came through college back in the, yeah, the 90s, um, gives you a little bit of, of how old I am. They were pushing everybody, go to college, go to college, get an academic degree. I mean, if you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so the trades weren't really pushed that much. Everybody was getting a four-year degree. And that was understandable because we had this dearth of people who had a four-year degree in this country. We needed people with bachelor's degrees. Unfortunately, I think that pendulum swung too far. And so now what we're seeing is, is that we've got this lack of skilled tradespeople, and that's affecting every state from coast to coast. It's especially hurting us in the South. I know for sure. And so what we're trying to figure out now is how do we balance this out? How do we get this balance between students who want to go into technical trades and technical programs and students who want to go the traditional academic route? So that's kind of what I've spent the last three years in Kentucky with us trying to sort this out. And there, we've had a lot of success, I think. I think we've got a long way to go. Um, so with, with those challenges, I think, you know, as I said, those are ubiquitous. There's also the fact that today, more than ever, students need at least some college. And that's the one category that I always tell people gets lost in the cracks. You, you tell people, well, I can get a technical degree or I can get an academic degree, but there's so much value just in students attending college, period, when they get through with high school. And the majority of our jobs now, we know from every economic study we read are going to require some form of post-secondary education, whether it's a short-term credential, whether it's a certificate, whether it's an associate degree or whether it's a bachelor's degree, everybody's got to have that. And from what I've seen, the, the biggest thing that I think that's been a challenge for me is watching how different colleges, and I study community colleges like I'm studying for a final exam, is this identity crisis that we're all seeming to have right now is we've got to figure out what we want to be because you can't be everything to everyone. And so it's, it's picking that niche that you're going to serve, whatever that is, based on the local needs that you have whether those be corporate needs, whether those be industry needs, whatever those are. And in Kentucky, what we've kind of 
come to realize our identity is, for lack of a better word for it, is we're going to be workforce training incubators. That's how the state's pushing that. That's what they're looking at. And that's not me, you know, unfortunately. I have gained so much knowledge in my experience there, but I want more of the comprehensive community college feel like they have here in Idaho, like they had in Meridian, Mississippi, where even though we can't be all things to all people, we can sure as heck try. And um, from what I've read about this college, you're doing that. What I've seen on the tour, you're doing that. So it makes me excited to possibly be a part of this. Wonderful. I'm going to bridge to the next question. Sound good? At NIC, we have a participatory governance model. What is your approach to college governance and how do you involve a variety of voices when soliciting input, especially on controversial topics? Well, and you hit the, the challenge on the head right there of, of my particular job that I have at ACTC as chief academic officer. And to give you a little background, when I was hired at ACTC, I kind of had a, a threefold mandate. And one of those things that I needed to do was calm down a campus that had been in turmoil. Um, they had been through three CAOs in two years. They had just gotten a new president in. And uh, the last CAO um, had, had really, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, not connected well with the faculty, had a more dogmatic, autocratic style approach of, you know, you're going to do it this, this my way or the highway. And I'm, I'm more the opposite. Um, I tend to be, I don't want to say laissez-faire because that's got a negative connotation because you might think I'm that way to the point where I'm comatose, but I do believe in everybody having a voice. I do believe in participation in whatever the decision is, and sometimes maybe too much so, but one of the first jobs that they gave me coming in, now I've, I've got this faculty who's very distrustful right off the bat because they, they had already seen a system where tenure has gone away in Kentucky at the community college level. Um, it's not that they, it was not a policy mandate, but a couple of iterations of presidents ago, the presidents got together and said, you know what, we're just not going to hire anybody else on the tenure track. Way, that's a great way to kill tenure, isn't it? So we haven't hired anybody on the tenure track. We've hired one person since I've been there. And so that's, that's, that's an issue. So I'm coming into this and I was told, you know, we're going to have to have a, a load overload policy. I thought, okay. But then when I looked at it, we had nothing. And we've got a group of career tech faculty over here and a group of gen ed faculty over here, and there's no equity in the pay structure. And so I was handed that and they said, here, fix this. So I thought, mm, you're not handing me this to fix all by my lonesome. No, 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 no. So I went to the first faculty meeting and I told the faculty, OK, we've got to fix this. So I'm going to put a committee together. We're going to look at this. We're going to study this. And we spent probably too long on this. We spent about a year and a half, believe it or not, looking at pay. I put some temporary things in because um, what was happening was is our technical faculty and our workforce faculty, they were having this huge, intense workload that was more than the gen ed faculty had, but they weren't being compensated for it at all. There was no overload pay if you were a welding instructor. There was no overload pay if, if you were an electrical instructor. There was no overload pay if you were an APT, that's our Applied Process Technologies Program instructor. And these folks are coming in, and the, and the, the reason this was important to me is because in Kentucky, they pay the professors the exact same amount. So the base pay is the same no matter what you teach. And so it rubbed a lot of people the wrong way when, Professor X over here who's teaching this subject, this person's making so much per credit hour overload, and this person over here is teaching twice as many credit hours, and they're making nothing. So you talk about walking through a minefield on that one, and we had to figure out a way that we could be equitable. We had to figure out a way, though, to be fair. Um, you know, we had to look at things like some of the labs that were on our technical side. Those are not the same as an instructor doing a traditional lecture. Um, so we had to balance all of these things out. And so we ended up with, with really a, a model that we used that we had looked at several different colleges across the country. And we ended up with some programs being paid on a credit hour basis. Some programs are paid on a contact hour basis. But we went back and forth and we went back to the faculty and they sent it back and we went back to the faculty and they sent it back. And we finally got a document that everybody agreed on. And so I presented it at the system office at a CAO meeting and they thought this was the greatest thing ever. And I said, well, I didn't do it. They did it, you know, and they said, we need to use this as a model. So that's probably something I was very pleased about as far as actually getting something done with faculty that did require a lot of participation. Um, I do believe in committee structure. Um, I do believe that, that faculty should own the curriculum. And that's one of the things that I am proud of how we do things in Kentucky is they do own the curriculum. Me as CAO, I'm a person who gets to make some decisions. I get to sign some pieces of paper. I get to give input, but I tell the faculty all the time, the curriculum's yours. 
you, you're, you're the ones that are responsible for this. And so that comes with, uh, I think, a great deal of has to come with respect and humility. And so uh, I, I defer to them on a daily basis. Thank you. So earlier you referenced in your introductory remarks, and I think it was part of the first answer to the first question is, is that you value comprehensive community colleges and that's what you're seeking to, to get back into a, a system that's more of a comprehensive holistic approach. So here's the next question. How do you facilitate and promote a holistic approach to education that includes students who are looking for the more formal, and the more informal informal learning opportunities for credit, non-credit on campus, virtual formats, schedules that are flexible, et cetera. Well, as far as from a scheduling standpoint, I'll tackle that first. That's been the hardest part of both what we were doing before the pandemic and after the pandemic. We're all scratching our heads trying to figure out what do our students want? And we've asked them. That's the, the first thing I said when I got there was, so what do the students want? So we did focus groups on two of our campuses and we asked the students, what is it that you want out of a flexible schedule? Well, we got conflicting answers, of course. Um, so I created this event that we do every semester and we call it Schedule Summit, where we get some of the best minds on campus, I think. We get faculty, we get staff, we get the enrollment services people, we get some program coordinators, myself, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. And we sit down in a room all day and we try to look at what improvements we can make to the schedule that will benefit the students. Now that's that's been the hardest part was right off the bat was convincing everyone that if this is really gonna work, we've gotta do everything we do for the benefit of the students. And, and I said, you know, I know there's, there's faculty here and I was one of them at my previous institution. I was tied to my schedule. I liked my class schedule. I didn't want anybody messing with it. But there were a few classes I had that were at times where students just didn't wanna take those anymore. And even though it was great for me, I finally had to give those up. Otherwise I wasn't gonna have any classes. So that's been, a, that's been a place where we've made some breakthroughs. Um, one of the things we did is we realized we needed more hybrid courses on the schedule. That was pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, we figured out that this high flex format seems to really work. And, and that was good for us. We were able to spend some HERF funds and we put cameras in every classroom on campus and we had those tied into the network. And so that was another one that took a little coaxing to get maybe some faculty members to say, I guess it is okay if they come some days in person and some days they, you know, they live stream on Blackboard. And so we've had some success with that. And the newest innovation we've gotten out of that group is, is we've got a, we've got two different campuses, main campuses. We've got our downtown campus and our industrial drive campus. And so we've got an instructor who really wanted to teach a class at both campuses, but for this particular class, couldn't get either one of them to make student wise, but she would have maybe six or seven students per class. So what we talked her into, and we're going to see how this works in the fall, fingers crossed, is we created this high flex model where on Tuesdays, she's going to teach in person or online at the main campus. And then on Thursday, she's going to do the same thing at the other campus. Students will be in the same section in this high flex format. So that's something that came after a lot of planning. Um, this fall, what we've got on the schedule for that is to try to figure out how we can do a boots on the ground schedule, because now we're finding that more of our students have shifted online during the pandemic and we can't get them back. And I was looking at your numbers and I think you're facing some of those same things. How do we get the students to come back to campus? And so we're trying to figure out because we've got really limited resources. We've seen our faculty and staff dwindle over the past couple of years because of budget cutbacks that happened before I got there. How can we get a schedule where we can guarantee to students, hey, if you want to come to campus, we can we can get you a schedule that's not online because I'm convinced there's a group of students out there because of what they saw in high school when the pandemic hit with online learning, they're frustrated by it and they want to go to class in person, but there's got to be a schedule for them. So that's probably the biggest thing I've seen from that regard. Do I have any time left or you want to move on? If you would like to add a little something, but if not, I'm going to keep us pacing and moving on. Okay, wonderful. How do you and how would you continue to grow and raise or um, strengthen morale and create a sense of community for all employees and all students at the college? Well, we definitely had some, some morale issues when I came in. And so we created a, a new committee as far as our institutional committees go. We created a culture committee. And that was the thing that they were dedicated to was trying to find ways to improve the campus culture. And we did include students on this. Now, the, the one thing that I'll say as a caveat to that is, is we don't have a lot of student life in Kentucky. 
you know, because we don't have those things like athletics. We don't, we're not a residential campus. We're commuters. And especially during the pandemic, a lot of student life disappeared. So that's been the challenge. But I will say, um, as, as an overall way to improve morale, we implemented a system that I'm, I'm just so proud of called uh, 40X. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, it's, it stands for the Four Disciplines of Execution. It is a Covey product. Covey, the same people that did, you know, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it was one of the Coveys that, that actually wrote this. But it's a system that you can use at your institution for continuous improvement, because not only did we have a morale problem, but we had we didn't really have a culture of continuous improvement when I got to the institution. And that was the second part of my mandate that the president told me he wanted me to help do when I got there is we've got to get this because we've got a fifth year report coming up in 2023 and our next decennial visit. We've really got to get this going. And so what 40X did is it gave us the opportunity to bond as a campus sharpen our focus on the things that we thought would be important and that got us busy and it did away with some of the some of the things that were there we tried to really break down the silos that existed there were lots of silos when i got to actc academics and student services didn't mesh at all the two deans weren't even speaking to each other it was it was that bad um we've now solved that problem the student services chief student services officers my best friend on campus we meet every day um, we, we love it. So, but 40X has been the thing I think that did it. And essentially what you do is you decide, okay, what are the one or two things we want to focus on as an entire institution? So you set those metrics. Then we divided the campus up into teams and we've got 30 teams of faculty and staff working together. And each of them decided based on what their area was that they operate in at the college, What's the most important thing for you to work on? We looked at data. We tried to find out where the gaps are. And so what it does is it allows you to focus on that, create initiatives within your group to do that. You meet on a weekly basis and you look at it like a game. I mean, it, it really is. It turns your work into play. You keep a scoreboard and everything. And it sounds crazy, but you would just have to see it to really appreciate it. And the strides that we made, I mean, I can't tell you. I, I'm, I'm still amazed by it. We raised... Our graduation rate for the 2015 cohort, I believe it was 38%. And for the 2019 cohort, our graduation rate's gone up to 43%. And I just, I can't get over that. It's, it's incredible. Our retention rate's gone up to 62% fall to fall. Our enrollment, where a lot of people's enrollments dropped during the pandemic, we went up. We actually increased enrollment. So, and I credit much of that work to that system, getting everybody to buy in, and getting everybody focused on that instead of some of the other problems we have. I really think it bonded the campus. Now you've got maybe one or two or three people around the campus. And if you mention 40X, they look down and go, yeah, I'm, when is this gonna end? But the majority of the campus really bought into it because it is a way to measure, to quantify the things that we're doing, to decide was it, what is it that I wanna focus on? What's the most important goal for me to have? And then when it does and you focus on that, a lot of other things kind of fall by the wayside, honestly. What are the challenges do you see for our next president here at North Idaho College? And how do you plan to address them if you become our next president? Well, I think probably some of the things that, you know, I walked into at ACTC, I know there's, there's been some, I know there's been some turmoil. I think um, probably the, I think probably the biggest thing that I see that, that this, and this is just my observation and it, and, a dollar fifty might get you a cup of coffee at the Waffle House, but I think that you need a president who understands the value of communication, can communicate with all constituent groups on campus, no matter who they are, um, regardless of politics, regardless of ideology, um, and and that is that is my forte. That's my area of expertise. It's why my president brought me into ACTC. He wanted me. He wanted me to heal some things. He wanted me to pull people together. Um, I think you need a, a consensus builder and a team builder. That is what I've staked my entire career on is my ability to build teams. That is, that is my forte. It's, it's, it's what I do above anything else. I am a coach. I'll go ahead and tell you. Um, I have coached high school sports. I've coached college sports. I have directed theater plays. I know that's weird. How can a person do both of that? Because it's the same approach. It's the same approach. You build a team. It's all about building a team and it's about coaching the team. Right now, my primary job in that arena as 
chief academic officer at ACTC is I coach the people that are on my team. That's the associate deans. That's the head of career services. That's the director of libraries. That's the director of e-learning. That's what I do. It's no different than, and I use the example, I heard Gary Danielson one day on CBS Sports say that people misunderstand Alabama football and Nick Saban. He said they think Nick Saban is this great person who's outstanding at coaching players. He's not. Nick Saban coaches the coaches. And that's exactly what the president has got to do. The president's got to coach the cabinet. That's their job. Now, does that mean that the president doesn't coach everyone? No, it doesn't mean that at all. Because one of the things that I feel very strongly about in any position of leadership or not is mentorship is extremely important. I challenged our faculty the first day I came in and spoke to them to be a mentor and find a mentor. And it's one of the things that I did when I got to the institution. I've got two mentors uh, in, in the town where we are. One is my boss, the president of the institution. The other is the president of the Ashland Alliance, who is our local chamber of commerce. They both mentor me in a lot of ways. I have chosen to mentor people too. I've got one faculty member that I've mentored into an associate dean in three years, and I could not be prouder of her success. It has been a joy to watch her develop professionally, and she's our new de associate dean of health sciences. She's going to do a fantastic job in that role. I've also got a couple of other faculty members that I mentor. Now, I have to be careful about this, obviously, because you know, if, if people, if, if this is really visible, you know, I don't want anybody saying, well, he's showing favoritism to this person or that person. But these are people who came to me and asked for this, because when I said, find a mentor, be a mentor, I had a couple of faculty who came to me and said, I would like to engage you on that level of mentorship. And so that's been, that's been very rewarding. So I think that's, uh, that's extremely essential as well. So I really think that a combination of a good communicator, I think you need somebody who can motivate people that can inspire people that can get the most out of them and and that's a couple of things that I would say you can read our resumes that's why I haven't said a whole lot about my resume you can read that you can compare candidates there's going to be five people here that that are will all be capable at for lack of a better term of phrasing it running a college okay I mean you get to this level you could you could put the job in one of our hands and and we would probably do uh, you know a decent job but is it what you're looking for one of my favorite quotes, one of my mentors who's deceased now is Dr. Bill Skaggs. And Dr. Skaggs was a former president, president emeritus at the institution where I came from. And when I went to get my PhD, he said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice unsolicited. I said, oh, that's great. I'll take it. He said, go get your degree. Do whatever you want to do. Do you want to be a president? I said, I think I do. He said, well, let me tell you this, Brand. He said, running a college is easy. And I said, what? What? He said, Brand, running a college is easy. Building community is hard. What do you want to do? Do you want to run a college or do you want to build community? And that's really stuck in my brain for the past 20 years. And I, I think you can do both. And, I, and that's what's important to me. It's not so much, yes, I've been trained on how to run a college. I've got a PhD in, you know, community college leadership. You know, I understand how these institutions work but it's building community. That's the most important thing to me. That's what I've tried to do in Meridian. That's what I've tried to do in Ashland, Kentucky. That's what I would try to do here. Thank you. And I promised to give you a little sense of a time check halfway through. So we're halfway through and we are rolling into question number six of eight. So you're doing great on time. Question number six, as a college president, I'm going to actually, this is a two part question, or I've just realized it's two parts in one question. So I'm going to split them up for you if that's okay. okay. Okay, great. As a college president, what is your perspective on academic freedom? It's got to be paramount. It's the most important thing. I mean, for, for students to get what they need to get out of a college experience, academic freedom to me is absolute. I don't think it should be infringed on period. Um, now, we, we see these limits tested every day. We see cases go up. People are suing each other left and right. We've dealt with some of this in Kentucky, but I will say that in our classrooms and KCTCS has kind of made it easy for us because their, their legal department has issued some clear mandates on the subject that our students have freedom of speech in the classroom. So do instructors. And I, and I think that classroom, classrooms are supposed to be the marketplace of ideas. I mean, that's what they exist for. If you can't if you can't discuss issues that are contemporary that affect society in a college classroom, then I don't know where in the heck you could do it. So um, I'm a champion for academic freedom. Um, I think there's obviously everybody's got their line that they've got to draw in the sand. Um, 
you know, we've had a lot of social upheaval in the last couple of years. We just have. If you know where I'm from, I'm from Kentucky. Ashland's here, Louisville's here. You know, go back to 2019. You know, you know where 2020, where we where we've come from. You all have Seattle and Portland, you know, right next to you. So this is this is a time definitely in our society where battle lines are being drawn, um, where people are taking sides. I just refuse to do that. I still think that the college professor's job is to teach students how to think critically about the world around them. Then the marketplace of ideas wins out. It's exactly what it's exactly what every Supreme Court case on the First Amendment's ever said is that the marketplace of ideas has got to exist and ideas have to be allowed to compete. So I'm a fan of that, always have been. I'm a communication uh, professor by trade. That's what I've done my entire career. And that's what I've always taught my students. I try to weave into my classes, humility, respect, and civility. You know, those things are very important to me. Now I understand that Everybody doesn't follow those things. Everybody's not civil. There's not civil discourse in this country like there should be. I wish there was more of it. I really do. So the second part to that question, as college president, what is your perspective on tenure? I was asked this question at the last institution um, when I came into ACTC. Um, I mean, I, I think tenure is a great thing. I do. I, don't, I mean, tenure is there for a reason. Tenure is there to make sure that if a president like me comes in and I don't like the politics of Professor X, that I don't not renew that person's contract. I mean, it's a safeguard. That's what it's there for. Um, now, we have tenure professors at ACTC. Um, we did not have tenure in Mississippi, believe it or not. I went went 17 years without seeing it. We had, though, uh, what the closest thing was you could have. Uh, I think you could... I'm not sure. I think you could kill somebody working in a Mississippi school and still get your contract renewed, depending on who it was. Because I mean, I've, I've ne you never see anybody's contract not get renewed. It's the craziest thing. Um, I'm, I'm kidding about the, the killing, of course. Sorry. Um, just, a, just a joke. I hope that didn't disqualify me. Um, but, but no, I, I think tenure is there for a reason. I think the tenure process is, has got to be rigorous. We've got a really rigorous process in Kentucky. And in Kentucky, by the way, you can still get promoted even if you're not on the tenure track. We still have a promotion. I know, right? It's weird. We still have a promotion process where you can go to associate assist, or assistant associate and full professor, believe it or not. So they kept the promotion process. And so you can be on two different tracks. Um, and we're in the process of revamping that right now. But uh, but I absolutely believe, believe that, that tenure is a good thing. And I would certainly not vote or endorse uh, doing away with that. Um, long as the procedures are being followed and and you've got a good tenure committee and people who understand um, that that is something that is significant uh, in a professor's life um, and that those standards are being upheld I have no problem with that so the next question is is as you've done your research of North Idaho College and I know we you've started touring at least the main campus and you'll have the opportunity to tour Parker Technical Education Center and Workforce Training Center so what are some things that you might do to facilitate collaboration between the credit and non-credit programs here at North Idaho College? That's been our same challenge at ACTC. And we've got three campuses, uh, I guess, just like you all. And we're, we're interesting. We're unique in Kentucky. We actually have a campus that's built in an industrial parkway. And we call that our Tech Drive campus. And so most of our technical programs reside there. And then we have our workforce training campus uh, on another side of town. So we've got those three sides of the house. And that's a, that's, I don't want to say that's a constant battle for us. That is, that is something that we work through on a daily basis because we've got a lot of institutions in Kentucky where there's contention there. For us though, again, we've tried to break down the silos. Uh, my boss was uh, Dr. Ferguson came out of workforce. That's what he was. He was the workforce director at that institution. He became the state workforce director. And then he went to Alabama, became a president and came back. So one of the things that drew me to work at Kentucky under, under Dr. Ferguson was, was his workforce knowledge, because that was a weakness in my resume I really needed to shore up. And so I've learned a lot about that. And we've got, we've actually got programs that coexist peacefully at ACTC for non-credit and credit. And um, most of those are short-term training programs like commercial truck driving, uh, we've got some short-term uh, training programs on the medical side. We've got our, you know, CNA programs. I've added phlebot phlebotomy since I've been there, um, EKG. We've also added a lineman program that's been very important because AEP needs linemen, so we've added that. 
Um, so as far as shoring up collaboration, here's how we do it. Dr. Ferguson kept the, the way that the reporting structure worked when I got there in that workforce. That person reports directly to the president, but she's not on cabinet. Think about that for a minute. So, but, but that's kind of the model that they use in Kentucky where workforce reports to the president. But what he does is every time there's a workforce meeting, no matter how big, no matter how small I'm in the room, he never meets with workforce without me. And so academics always has a presence there. And so workforce, those folks and I work hand in hand. We have also revamped our career services division at the college in that we hired a full-time person in career services. And so Dr. Ferguson put that person reporting to me. And so now that, that, that ensures that we have to have collaboration between academics and workforce because the career services people are over here. Now they do resume writing, they do mock interviews with students. They also work with the program coordinators on all the internships and apprenticeships. So that's facilitated through my side of the house. And so because of that, that ensures that that cooperation continues. And there we, we've been in a lot of meetings around the state where we've gotten some kudos from people who say, I haven't seen a college where workforce academics, they, they sit so closely together at the same table. I said, well, we've got it set up where we have to. So that's kind of the same thing that I would do. Uh, if, if I were here is I would, in, I would encourage academics and when workforce to collaborate more. Also, not only do I go to their meetings, but she comes to academic meetings as well. Well, you mentioned starting a lineman program in Kentucky. When you get a tour of both workforce training and Parker, you'll see that we saw uh, an industry need and jumped in and we just launched a lineman um, training here this spring as well. So you'll be interested in that. I love that program. We have a, a lineman rodeo at the end of every class and families come out and we actually get the grills out and cook burgers and we watch them climb the poles and do their thing. And then we've got an end of program assessment that we use where we've actually got the people in the industry to come in and evaluate the linemen for their end of program assessment. So that was a, that was the thing I'm really proud of as well. Great. Well, someone may mention something to you that's been around for a long time here. Um, Hammers, no, do I have it right? Hard hats, hammers, and hot dogs is a program that we do with also high school students too to, to, okay. to get them involved. So, okay, this is our final question. You have plenty of time. I'm, I'm gonna actually split it into three questions though because it's like a pepper of, of three questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask you the first one and then we'll build on it. How do you develop talent at an institution? Oh boy. That's a big one. Um, well, you, you better have a good professional development budget, which is, is something that, that I do think we do a good job of uh, in Kentucky. We do have a huge portion of our, our annual budget that's set aside for professional development for faculty and staff. Um, we encourage them to go to conferences. We bring in people to the institution and we have a lot of cross collaborative efforts that we do with our sensor institutions in the Commonwealth where we work on, on common initiatives. And that's, that's a big thing. And for us, that comes from CPE. CPE in Kentucky is our council for post-secondary education. They, they are the controlling body for all of higher ed. And so they kind of set the tone for this and the policy. And so everything that we do, whether it's at a four-year or at a two-year in Kentucky, comes from the one goal that CPE has, and that's 60% by 2032. We've all got that memorized. We want 60% of the people in Kentucky to have a post-secondary credential by the year 2032. And so that makes it fairly, fairly easy to when we want to look at initiatives and when we want to do things. So um, for, for us, I think it starts with, with that. It starts with professional development. There's a million places you can go with that. Um, we also do, I think, a good job at our institution with aiding faculty who want to further themselves with advanced degrees, which we always find money to help people to pay for advanced degrees. Um, and it doesn't matter what department you're in. Uh, Dr. Ferguson finds the money. We've got donor money in the foundation. We've got a thing called cooperative funds, which is actually, we're the only school in Kentucky that has these shared cooperative funds with the K-12 schools. We've got a pot of money there. And I can't tell you how many forums I've signed since I've been there on an instructor who wants to get a master's degree or on a staff member who wants to get a bachelor's degree, but we encourage that. And it's the only way you're going to do it. One of our next focuses of our strategic plan, believe it or not, um, I was fortunate. I got to be able to write the themes for our next strategic plan. So our themes are going to be people, processes, and partners. And so mm -hmm. for our people, we're going to create a new metric that we're going to track. And it's, it's going to have to do with retention of faculty and staff. We're going to target that as something that's important to the institution that we keep and develop the people that we have. Because if you, if you don't do that, then, then you're, you're going you're gonna to lose your, your institutional culture really quickly. You, you, can't, you can't build it if you're constantly having to replace it. 
Okay. You have started to answer the second part of the question. So you can say answered it, or you can elaborate if you'd like. Uh, how do you help employees gain new skills at all levels of the institution? Okay, I see where you're going with that. This, this is where I don't think, I don't want to say this is true at all institutions, but I can't, I can't say that. But every institution that I've been at, we do a poor job of cross-training employees. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think that that's something that absolutely has to be the next evolution of what we do with employees once they're onboarded. Um, we tried to do some of this at Meridian. We tried to cross train some employees just for functionality sake. Um, but it's hard to do because everybody stays so caught up in their own job. And that's, that's where 40X comes in, is that it's the idea that you can't let the day-to-day -day things, and they, could, they term that the whirlwind, the day-to-day -day things of just keeping the doors open and keeping processes moving at the college you've got to be able to step back and you've got to be able to take a percentage of your time and say, okay, we've got to set aside this time to work on these new things, to work on these new initiatives, because everybody in this room can probably think of a time where you were really fired up about some new initiative or some new project and everybody was on board and you got busy. And six months later, you looked at somebody and said, are we still doing that? Yeah, I don't know. You know, that's, that's how it goes. So it, it's got to be intentional is, is where I'm going with that. There's got to be intentional design, but I think that that's absolutely necessary, especially in the era we're in. Number one, with the, we're still in the midst of the great resignation in this country. It's affected colleges as well as anybody else. Um, but two, just the fact that people are so mobile now and you never know when somebody's going to pop up and say, hey, I'm out of here. It happened to us the other day. Our head of maintenance jumped up and said, I'm out of here. You know, and so we're, we're headed into a fall semester now. I've got to now figure out how in the world am I going to finish a rad tech lab when the person that was in charge of the project is leaving in a week and we don't have anybody to replace them in house. So that's going to be a challenge because I have to get that lab finished because we've already sent the sub change into SACS. We've got a program coordinator coming in. So I, I've, I've got to learn how to how to be a, a maintenance person, you know, a chief mm -hmm. maintenance officer all of a sudden. You talk about day to day and you just mentioned pop ups uh, with our media team here in communications and marketing. We always like to say we're playing whack-a-mole, yep. um, the game of whack-a-mole on any given day. And then it comes back to the, the longer term pro projects and staying on task with that. Thank you. So here's the final part of that question. How do you keep good people? Well, I have found that if people feel valued, that's the key. If people feel valued, if they feel like they're an integral part of what's going on, then you have a better chance. Um, we did have uh, in this person, uh, in a, a person that I mentioned, um, she had gotten a great offer from another institution for way more money than I could pay her. I mean, she, she just did. Um, and so we sat down and talked about it and she was talking with her family about it. And, um, you know, ultimately she decided to stay and I just blew me away. I said, I can't believe, why are you staying here? You know, like I told you go, you know, ch chase the money. And she said, well, you know, money isn't everything. She said, the grass definitely looks greener over there. She said, green being money green. I said, yeah, I, you know, I get that. But you know, what is it? She said, well, we've just come so far as an institution here. We've worked so hard to move the needle from here to here. And especially with regards to nursing, because when I got, when I got there, Oh, our nursing program was in bad shape. We had three years of subpar uh, NCLEX scores. We had accreditors breathing down our neck. And so I've got an ACE in accreditation I'm facing as soon as I come in the door. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're just now, we just now found out the other day where, that they were, they're recommending reaccreditation for us. We've got we've to move the needle on the test scores a little bit, but I think we've got everything lined up where we can do it. And she said, I just feel like I'm a part of something here. And I think that's it. I think that money isn't everything, you know, and, and, you know, economists have done studies. They've said, you know, this is the salary where if you make more than this much money in a year, you know, it really doesn't increase your happiness. So I, I think it's more so really finding out what it is that motivates people and making them feel like they're a part of that. And everybody wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves. I don't care who they are. That's, that's, that's where I find fulfillment in life. It's not in money. It's not in prestige. It's not in power. It's about doing something. So I think that's probably the best answer I can come up with to that question. Well, thank you. So we do have about 10 plus minutes left. Is there any question you would like me to ask you again that you wanted to go back to or elaborate on? Or this is your time. This is the floor for you. <laughs> 
All right. Didn't paste that very well, did I? No, I no, you, you, you know, no, you did, did well. I, I just think that you, you've hit on all the things that, 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 that I came here, you know, to talk about as far as promoting myself. You know, you, you may have, you know, you may have some candidates that have more, uh, more on their resume than me. You, you, you may very well. That's, that's quite possible. I don't, I don't discount that. But, but I would, again, ask you to go back to just a couple of things. Um, you know, one is, as you're looking at the five candidates, ask yourself, which of these, which of these five is going to get the most out of every person here? That's, that's, that's one aspect. I would ask another question. As, as we're looking at bad things that happen, you know, you're asking me, what do I think uh, this institution needs with somebody coming in? We're going to have bad times. We're going to have down times. We're going to have crises. We just are. Which president, which person do you think would be a better president in a time of crisis? Now, all of us are going to talk about our roles in the pandemic. Everybody is because that's, you know, the biggest crisis we've seen in higher education in our lives. So every person coming in here has served through the pandemic. I get that. There are also other times, though, when the crises may not be as big. It may be an economic crisis. Um, we've had our share of those at ACTC. I tell you, um, I, I really felt like there were times I wanted to, to, to look at my family and go, we really should go back to Mississippi based on what we faced. Because not only did I come into the situation I came into, and we've got the pandemic, but right before the pandemic, and when I say right before the pandemic, I mean two months before the pandemic starts, we find out our two largest, two of our largest employers in our district shutting their doors. Wow. Major hospital out, we're gone. They made the announcement on a Wednesday night. I can remember uh, just seeing the shock and the, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Look on people's faces because uh, our region in the Ashland Huntington metropolitan area, it's got a population of about 325,000, but we're a regional hub of healthcare. And we're talking a major hospital, our lady at Belfont, closing the doors, no warning, no nothing. They're gone. Then AK steel, which was a huge steel plant. The last one left in Kentucky announced they're closing their doors. So you talk about a double whammy. Now on top of that, <laughs> and you can do this research on your own. If you want to read something that reads like a, like a lifetime movie, um, there was a company called Brady that was, that was invented. There was a, a, there was a CEO of that company named Craig Bruchard and he had come into Kentucky. And this is when I'm all coming in, right? They had announced they were going to build a $1.2 billion rolling steel mill. That's going to be the savior for northeastern Kentucky. It's going to bring a thousand jobs and it's, it's going to bring prosperity for the next several generations. And so it's this really big deal. They got the state of Kentucky to donate $15 million to the project. And the program and the plant are going to be built on our industrial drive campus. It's going to be built right there. So this is what I come into. So I'm thinking, this is great, boss. You know, I'm telling my president, this is going to be fantastic. You know, this will, wow, this will make your career. You can stay here forever. And then fast forward to a year later, they're gone. The CEO has taken the golden parachute. His board has kicked him out. He took about $20 million and ran. So now we've got an empty field we're looking at outside of Ashland, Kentucky in our Tech Drive campus. We've got signs that are now afraid that have this company's name on it. We've got a program that was put in place and funded by KCTCS. We spent a million dollars while I was there on a lab for this program. We called it Advanced Industrial Technology, AIT. It's very similar to the FAME program. It's very similar to, it's a, it's a type of industrial maintenance is what it is. So I've got a hundred, I've got a hundred students in this program with 75 of them about to graduate when this, these people announce this deal isn't happening. What do you do? Talk about a crisis. So we are in full blown panic mode. What are we going to do with these students? Oh my gosh. Well, I can tell you what we did. We found jobs for them. That's what we did. Now, some of them had to move away. They weren't happy. They weren't happy at all. But what we kept telling people was this is a viable program. I know we put it in. Yeah, because these students were going to go work at this plant. But this is not the only place you can work. There's going to be brighter days ahead. And the, the PR, the PR game was long. We've been playing a long PR game with this one. Um, we got those students employed. We have now finally had to shut that program down because what we found was is that the public tied it so much to that one company and the taste was just so bad in everybody's mouth. We couldn't rebrand it. We tried and tried and tried and couldn't rebrand it. So we're going to have to close it. And so it's going to merge with our industrial maintenance program, which we're going to try to revamp. So those are, those are some of the things that I've seen in, in my career. Hurricane Katrina is another one I saw in my career. If you're familiar with that, I'm from Mississippi. 
it hit my house, ripped the roof off. And I was at work the next day. Um, I can remember going up to the college because we were, the, our town was just decimated by Katrina. Not as bad as some in Louisiana and certainly not as bad as the coast. But I can remember my wife, who was working in the business office at the college at the time, said, we've got to go make payroll. I said, what? She said, people got to get paid, Todd. I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? She said, well, the president told me to, we're going to go out there and we're going to pay people. I said, how are you going to pay people? She said, we're going to pay them cash. I said, I'm sorry. What? So I can remember driving up to the college. I remember this vividly sitting next to my wife and a campus police officer. We're both armed to the teeth because she's got a couple of million dollars in cash sitting there beside her and his employees are driving up. She's handing them cash. I remember that. That now that is that is um, quite an experience if you've never had it. But how do you bring a college back from that? That's one of those things that we dealt with. It's one of those things that me, I was I was a very young division chair um, that, that we had to deal with in academics. How are we going to get the students back? How are we going to work with the students who don't have power? We were the last house in the county um, after Katrina hit to get power back. We were out of power for four weeks. So I'm sitting there having to go to, you know, to go to work every day and you got to put a smile on your face and you got to tell everybody things are going to be all right because they are, they are bad things happen. You know, life happens every day. That's one of Dave Ramsey's famous quotes, but it's how you react to it. And so the one thing that I think um, has carried me farther in my career than anything else is just the value of, of a positive attitude. Um, you will find that I'm the most positive person you'll ever meet. If I'm the person selected for this job, I don't have a bad day. I don't know what that is. I don't know what a bad day is because to me, every day I wake up is a great day. And when I get up every morning and before I go to bed every night, this is going to sound corny. This is going to be the corniest thing you'll ever hear. But I literally ask myself, I've got the mission statement of the college memorized. And I ask myself in the morning, what are you going to do to advance the mission statement in the college in your job? Because we change lives. That's what we do at community colleges. And when I go to bed at night, I look at myself in the mirror and I say, what did you do today to make somebody's life better? And if I can't answer that, I feel terrible. I mean, I really, really feel terrible. But I'll tell you a story real quick. I got, what, seven minutes? The third thing I would ask you in evaluating a presidential candidate is which one is going to tell North Idaho's story the best? Because part of being a president is dealing with politicians fundraising, all those aspects. Politicians, when we would go to the legislature every year to lobby in, in Mississippi, we did our own lobby. And so we had teams of faculty and staff and students that so we would storm the Capitol every year, wouldn't really storm it, that's an exaggeration. But we had our week that we would go and lobby. And our job was to tell our story to legislators because they listen to constituents. And that's how they make decisions involving millions of dollars. So you don't think we pulled on their heartstrings? You better believe we did. And if you were a good storyteller, you could you could go pretty far. But I'll tell you a true story from my from my life. One of the reasons that I love community colleges is I was born in the 70s, came from what is now what used to be called a broken home, whatever that is. That's what they told me growing up. You're from a broken home. What does that mean? My parents were divorced. Right. So I had a single mother, grew up with a single mother. And we had to move back in with my grandparents after she got divorced from my father. So I remember that vividly growing up with grandma and grandpa. And so mom was young and she was uneducated. She had a high school diploma. Well, single mother with a high school diploma doesn't have many prospects in 1975. So she was trying to figure out what she could do. So what she did is she got into a program that was run by Heinz Junior College at, at Heinz General Hospital, in Jackson, Mississippi. And she got to go to x-ray school and she got to go um, on this program where she didn't have to pay anything. She was a single mother. And so she studied hard. My mother was smart enough to have gone to medical school, believe it or not. She made a really high score on the ACT, but I've got this young kid. I can't go to med school in 1975. Women just couldn't do that with small kids and no husband. And so she went through the program and not only did she complete it, she made the second highest score in the state of Mississippi that year on the registry exam. The point is, if it hadn't been for that community college program, I don't know what would have happened to us. I don't know if I'd even be standing here. And every time I think about it, it just makes me realize why I do what I do, because that program changed my life. And that's what we do at community colleges. We change lives. I tell you that story just so you get a little bit more of a, a view into who I am. 
but also to see the importance of storytelling. That's what a good president does. They're able to tell your story to others. So those are the things that I would say in leaving here. You know, I would ask myself, one, who's going to tell our story better out of the five candidates? You know, I would ask, who's going to be the person that I want to lead in a crisis? Anybody remember the third? I'll poll the audience. Come on. Let's see if you're paying attention. Say again. Sorry. Bringing teams. Say again. Storyteller was one. The other one's who's going to get the most out of people. Who's going to get the most out of people? Who's going to be the one that's there coaching, developing talent, leading on a daily basis? Humbly, I ask you to consider me when, when the time comes. Um, I'm hoping that somehow I rise to the top. If not, then I hope the next president you get will absolutely do an outstanding job at those things. Um, last thing I will say is it's been an honor to talk to you. It's been my privilege and I appreciate you being here and caring enough about this institution that you would take the time out of your day to hear me speak. Thank you, Dr. Brand. And I'm gonna say, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna say thank you to you for taking the time to research North Idaho College, make the decision to apply and to have gone through this process thus far um, and the desire to be our next president. Um, that does not go unnoticed and we greatly appreciate it. And on behalf of students you see here in the immediate audience, faculty and staff and community members, as well as the number of students, staff, faculty and community members that have been watching on Zoom, there'll be another opportunity for Dr. Brand to be able to participate in an afternoon forum. And I had mentioned earlier, my colleague, um, Dean Sherry Simpkins, our Dean of General Studies, will be me or will be your facilitator at 145. We will have another open forum here where Dr. Brand will get to entertain another series of questions, as well as four o'clock this afternoon on the lower level here in the same building in Driftwood Bay, our board of trustees will have the opportunity to interview Dr. Brand as well. So thank you again. I hope you and your wife have the opportunity to explore and enjoy the great city of Coeur d'Alene and the whole entire community of North Idaho and the opportunity to get a little more sense of our community. And with that, we will close and we'll give you a little chance to breathe and to relax before your next adventure. Thank you everyone for coming.